Welcome to Navigating the Customer Experience. Want to improve your organization's customer service? Looking for insider tips to knock your customer socks off? Then you're in the right place. Here's your host, Yannick Grant. Welcome to Navigating the Customer Experience. On today's episode, we have with us a very special guest. His name is Suman Sarkar. Suman has more than 20 years of international consulting experience. He has a proven track record delivering innovative and strategic approaches to the supply chain and sourcing practices with outstanding results. As an author, he understands the power of creativity that will be unleashed if businesses can harness the talent they already have in-house. He is a partner with 3S Consulting. He holds a Bachelor in Mechanical Engineering from IIT in Karugpur, India, and a Master's in Industrial Engineering from NITIE in Mumbai, India, graduating at the top of his class from both schools. And he's also a holder of an MBA from UCLA in Strategy and Finance. The author of the very popular book, Customer Driven Disruption. So without further delay, welcome Suman. Thank you, Anikya. Thank you for having me uh, in the podcast today. Great. Could you tell us a little bit about your background, how you got into what you're doing currently, and you know, like maybe what inspired you to get into writing about customer-driven um, disruption? Sure. Um, very shortly, Anikya, I, I grew up in India, and there, you know, I come from a very small town, and I think uh, that the only reason I came out from that small town is because I was always interested in figuring out what's the root cause of anything, right? And that led me to engineering school. My teachers always used to mention this to me, that, uh, you know, um, Suman was probably not the fastest kid in the class, but he actually figures out what's the root cause of anything. And so he essentially comes up with solutions that are great. Now, I have kept that trait throughout my life. Uh, now, it, it kind of drove many of my bosses crazy because, you know, <laughs> I, I took my time to figure things out. But whatever solutions I came up, my customers loved it. My clients loved it. Many of the things I've done are still in, in practice. They've got companies still use it. And, and, you know, that's one of the reasons why I have had the opportunity to work with large number of successful companies. Uh, one of the things I have learned over the years as I've been working with these companies is that they are not destined to su- be successful or remain successful. And and the primary root cause of that comes from the fact that companies are not focused on, on customers. Uh, they are focused on investors. They are not doing things that will make them, endear them with the customers. And now, since customers are more informed, as you know, Yanuka, because of internet and, and you know, um, computers, smartphones, they're more informed and they are more likely to, uh, to change companies uh, than ever before. But the lack of focus on customers is really what's driving disruption and failure of many large companies. And what we are seeing is the start of a tsunami, not the tsunami itself. And, and this book is a plea for corporates and startups and everybody else to focus on why it comes to business that, that's customers. And, and then book gets into strategies around how you can meet those needs and what, strat, uh, what operational capabilities you need and then organization structure and the details around it. But it gives you a background on why I wrote this book. Right. Beautiful. Okay. So one of your quotes is disruption can be a death sentence to a business, but it doesn't have to be. You can use the threat to focus on what's important, which is your customers, right? Absolutely. Could you explain to us what do you mean by disruption? Like what is your definition of disruption and why do you make the analogy of it being, it can, you know, it possibly being seen like a death sentence? Sure. A disruption is essentially a complete change in direction. Um, and, and what essentially, uh, essentially happens is uh, there was a demand for, you know, um, there was a demand for organic milk. And suddenly, you know, the demand for organic milk vanishes and people are buying now, you know, coconut milk or uh, almond milk. Mm-hmm. For a producer producing, or for a farmer that produces organic milk, it's a disruption to their business. It's completely, uh, you know, 
uh, messes up their business because they have no idea how they can now survive or meet customer new customer demand because this is a this is a complete shift that they don't control. It's not only happening to the farmers; it's happening all around us. Uh, retail, you can see a lot of businesses going out of business. Uh, you know, closing shop, going going to chapter like, uh, eleven. Yeah, they they are going bankrupt. Mm-hmm. Uh, you see, GE in trouble, and and every industry. Uh, for example, packaged food industry. See, meaning the industry is going down the drain. Uh, craft is having problem. Many uh, many packaged food companies are in trouble. Uh, and their you know companies are changing their CEOs. The problem is not around one or few industries. It's all around us. Uh, the question is who is first and who is last. But it's happening all around. It's not only affecting the companies. If you take a step back and look at broader view and take it at a country level, you see start to see the impact of customer changing needs on on countries. For mm-hmm. example, you know oil. Oil demand is going down. The price is falling, and and it's already starting to disrupt many economies like Venezuela and other places. We are starting to see that disruption happen. Right? Even Saudis are now looking to uh, you know diversify their economy. The changing customer needs could be a death sentence if you don't keep up with those needs. But if a company does well in keeping up with those needs, they are very very successful. Mm-hmm. Uh, Take, for example, Aldi, right? Grocery companies are struggling with uh, with meeting customer needs. They're all introducing, you know, home delivery and, you know, um, self-driving cars to get products to homes and all that. But Aldi has continued to focus on uh, affordable product, uh, high-quality affordable product. And and they they have uh, you know captured most of European grocery market uh, you know the discount grocers are biggest uh, grocers in Europe and and they they are starting to expand footprint in the U.S. They are going to be the third largest grocers in the U.S. While grocery companies are focused on delivering you know uh, to home, all these focused on getting you the better the best quality product at a at a very competitive price. And in my town where I live, uh, I see a large number of people going to Aldi, whereas very few go to the other grocers. And what it basically tells me is that the companies that are focused on customer needs are likely to be successful. The companies that are not focused on customer needs are likely to find it challenging. And more so now because people are very, very well informed mm-hmm. than ever before. And and. Basically, that's what the disruption is all about, right? If you can figure out a way to meet the needs, then it works for you. Yes. If you are holding on to the past, it's a dead sentence. Yes, agreed. Okay, thank you so much for that um, explanation for us. Now, in your book, you speak about generational shifts, right? Absolutely. Um, are you able to give us some examples of how you think that has led to major changes in the market? Uh, absolutely. Yeah, you know, I mentioned uh, just before that there, there is a tsunami happening, right? Coming, right. and we are just seeing probably the first waves of tsunami. And the driver behind this tsunami or the disruption is really the general generational changes, right? The millennials and Gen Zs who are be starting to become actually millennials are like are becoming the largest buying group in the country. Not only in the U.S. Actually, uh, it's all around the world. Right. Uh, while baby boomers are all retiring. Now, the needs of baby boomers were, are very different from millennials, right? Millennials are completely different than baby boomers in many ways, 180 degree different, right? They don't buy beer, right? And, and, and there are many things, like they don't like ownership. They are in much, they, they have a large debt, educational debt, so many of them are very conscious about where they spend money, mm. and they are essentially looking for solutions that meet their needs. And they are ready to throw away the old norms out of the window. Uh, my, my favorite is actually in Japan. Japan is a very conservative society. But their millennials, like uh, U.S. millennials, are very different. Mm-hmm. For example, they don't drink as much, right? Uh, if, you have no, if you've been in Japan, you would see that that used to be, used to be the norm uh, in earlier generations. They don't own cars. They don't like to drive, right? <laughs> uh, they they own uh, they don't own watches. They don't work long hours in offices. So yes, millennials are very different. And if you want to address millennials, you have to completely rethink 
the strategies and, and that work with baby boomers mm-hmm. and do very differently with millennials. Right. Uh, millennials are into very are very health conscious. I just talked about packaged food industries. The reason they are having trouble is because they don't have healthy and you know fresh food options for millennials. So of course millennials are not buying from them, right? The traditional grocery companies are challenged because millennials love fresher, locally grown, you know, uh, socially conscious, all that, uh, you know, food. And they find that primarily in farmer's market. So the farmer's market, which is where, you know, the local farmers bring their produce to sell, not the, you know, stalls, but these are big markets, just Mm -hmm. like big grocery stores. Millennials go there, uh, meaning it's really popular with them. And uh, they are the largest going category in the country right? in terms of grocery, uh, you know, fresh produce category. So, so yes, millennials and, and are very different. And because their needs are very different, it's a generational changes that's driving the disruption. Millennials are into personalization, right? And so there are two things in my mind distinguishes uh, millennials in terms of selling to them, right? One is clearly they don't have large disposable income because of the debt they carry. Right. And the second one is they are very they, they like to express their individuality, right? Mm-hmm. Much True. more than any other generation, right? Mm-hmm. And what happens with that is the whole concept of personalization coming in the play. So if a retailer, apparel retailer, don't have stylist or ad- provide advice to you know how to dress and all that, how to be uh, unique. Those retailers are having a, lot, a hard time. That's why you see so many apparel retailers are actually struggling in the face of it. But retailers who offer some kind of personalization are successful. Uh, look at Sephora, right? Sephora is doing uh, very well with with uh, younger generation because they provide you know uh, cosmetics that are tuned to skin tone and they use the information system and you know their database to figure out what's what's the skin tone of a person and they match the right product and they are doing very well. So whoever has figured out even a little bit of personalization is doing well in, in today's world and personalization is likely to become bigger and bigger. Complete different mindsets from the large companies, the, how they work, right? They are all still baking standardized product and trying to sell it to the masses. Mm. Uh, even Apple does it, right? Now, you get three varieties of Apple pro- uh, products and that's it. You know, and they sell it based on three cameras or whatever features it is. For to sell it to millennials, you have to you have to do things more personalized, and you have to talk about, hey, how does it uh, you know help you get uh, things that you want, like you know photography or things like that. Cameras probably don't make sense to them. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so it's probably a 180 degree change in thinking required from businesses. And agreed. otherwise, millennials will kind of, you know, disrupt them. Yes, agreed. So so you mentioned personalization and the fact that with the generational shift in terms of how baby boomers performed or, you know, bought or interfaced with businesses versus millennials and Gen Zs. Now, a lot of companies um, are of the opinion that it's okay if they lose one or, you know, two customers because they can attract new ones. What are your thoughts on trying to just keep the ones that they have already happy? <laughs> so, yes, this is also kind of I talk about in the book. Uh, focus on your current customers before you focus on new. You know, and, and you point out a, 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 a very, uh, very traditional thinking in business. It's okay to lose, you know, current customers. Let's continue to fill the funnel, right? Right. Um, and that kind of is completely nonsensical because if you look at the research, um, research shows that current customers likely to spend more and they are much, much more profitable than the newer customers. And, and you can look at industry, under, uh, uh, industry after industry. For example, there was a, a great article on WSJ on Whole Foods. Uh, has Whole Foods has grown, what, what's unique about it is they increased it, their customer base, but the profitability and sales per new customer has declined quite significantly. Wow. And that's true for most businesses. If you look at existing customers are likely to be more loyal and likely to spend more and, and be more profitable because you're not spending money to acquire them than a new customers. But companies actually do complete reverse way. 
if you have ever uh, signed up for an internet service in the U.S., you would know uh, the internet companies will give you a discount to the new customer, whereas they will try to increase prices for their existing customers, uh, which is essentially encouraging them to switch or move away, right? Sure. Um, and, and, and this dislike or dishonesty towards, if I can call that word, towards the existing customers is a problem because that kind of breaks upon. And once a customer moves away, tries somebody else's product, they're not likely to come back. And, and there lies the challenge. Keeping existing customers happy first is, the, is probably the, should be the first focus before companies spend a lot of money on acquiring a new one. Having a hole in the bucket is not going to help you, right? I mean, it's it's the first thing you should do is to patch up the hole before you you know pour more water. I think that's what we <laughs> tell in the book. Very true. Very true. All right. Now, can you also share with us maybe some companies that you think are doing it right? Like, if you know some of our listeners, if they're saying to themselves, "What are some organizations that I could look at that I could benchmark maybe some of their best practices and principles that they're doing to stay ahead of um, what's happening?" And to ensure that they're, you know, meeting their existing customer needs, but also trying to exceed those customer needs in the same process. Absolutely. Many. There are many, many companies that do well, right? Let's start with the first one. Uh, Amazon does a great job, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so does many of the large uh, e-commerce companies, right? You know, Alibaba and others. They do a great job. I just spoke about Aldi, right? Aldi is a great example. Um uh, Southwest is another example. Disney is another example. Chick-fil-A, I talk about how Chick-fil-A quality is so great. Uh, even in the QSR, you know, uh, quick, quick uh, uh, you know, McDonald's kind of a space, they do very, very well. Right. Um, I talk about some of the international companies like, you know, um, Hire in, in China. Hire in China has done an amazing job of, you know, creating an organization that keeps evolving with customers. I, in the very beginning of the book, I talk about an Indian company called uh, Patanjali, uh, who have introduced this, you know, uh, plant uh, herb-based chemical, uh, what do you call, um, um, consumer good products in India, and they have challenged the, you know, <laughs> the industry leader Hindustan Lever uh, in, in all categories virtually. and and they are right now I think half the size of Unilever in India. And, and they're competing to become the biggest uh, consumer goods company in India. Uh, right. Unilever had eight years of dominant presence in India. There are examples in every market to look at, right? Uh, there's Zara in, in Europe that has, again, uh, it, it's in a fast fashion world, but has done a great job of mm-hmm. addressing customer needs, right? Mm-hmm. There are companies in every niche that does very good job. And they are the companies who, uh, who survive, right? And, and all you have to do is to walk around and see where the customers are lining up and, and buying stuff. Even Apple does a good job, but the problem lately has been Apple hasn't really figured out the changing needs, and they have been trying to sell the same old product. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there are a large number of companies out there you know, that, that do amazing job of uh, being focused on customers and continuing to you know, uh, evolve themselves to meet right. the needs of evolving, you know, customers as they change. Thank you. All right. So, Saman, could you share with us what's one on- online resource, tool, website, or app that you absolutely can't live without in your business? Sure. Uh, well, <laughs> the one that I always use and I can't live without in my business is uh, Wall Street Journal. Um, my, my business is essentially driven on knowing what's happening in my market, in, right. in the industry in general. Mm-hmm. And Wall Street Journal it has been the greatest of the resources that I have, frankly. Uh, yeah, it gives me not only the perspective from the U.S., but also shares uh, information from all around the world. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's, it's timely. Uh, and also, uh, they, they do a good amount of data collection and research. So, so I like Wall Street Journal. They don't have a very political bias to it. I mean, of course, they have a little bit of political bias. Mm-hmm. But most of their articles and businesses uh, is very good. And, and, and I find that the, I, I spent quite a lot of time reading and understanding what they are sharing about the world and different companies and all that. Okay, very good. Could you share maybe one or two books that have had the biggest impact on you? 
Yes, uh, and and I'm I'm sure you're going to laugh at this. Um, <laughs> I, I read a lot of science fiction. So, you know, um, as an as, as a engineering student, I, I spent a lot of time reading about robots and iRobots. I, I don't know if you have read those. Uh, I think the movie was made on iRobots. Yes, I've seen the movie. I've never read the book, though. Yes, yes. And, and yeah, Isaac Asimov. Isaac Asimov had a huge impact when I was a kid. And, and he wrote a series of, you know, uh, books about future and how the future society will evolve, how technology will evolve, and we do see a lot of things he said is coming true. Yeah. So yeah, he has he has been a great great influencer on me. Mm-hmm. Um, the book I really like lately was um, called uh, Freakonomics. I don't know if you read the book Freakonomics by uh, a, a group in in University of Chicago. I've they heard of it. About, yes. Uh, they talk about how economics affect all parts of our society. When we think about economics, we think business, mm-hmm. but really that drives everything. Whether it's uh, you know uh, people who are in gangs, whether it's prostitution, and the way they use the concept of economics all throughout the society and how it impacts every aspect of the society was amazing to me. Uh, mm-hmm. I really liked that book. I was very interested in, in you know, their thinking outside the box and then picking up the threads of societal problems and how do you go about solving them. Right. very interesting. Okay. All right. So we'll have the links to those two books that um, Suman mentioned in the show notes of this episode. Now, Suman, could you share with us what's one thing that's going on in your life right now that you are really excited about? Either something that you're working on to develop yourself or your people. Yes. Um, believe it or not, um, I'm actually working on a startup right now. Um, it's called Pronto Home Delivery, and we are in the process of launching this service uh, in Tennessee. Nice. Uh, and it, it's a complete new way of looking at how you can uh, service customers, particularly, you know, there are a segment of U.S. customers who can't, you know, go to grocery stores or different stores mm-hmm. to buy and all that. And we are trying to figure out how to do that in a very cost-effective and in a very high-quality and customer-focused fashion. Right. And we are launching that service uh, in a few days, actually, uh, here. And and I'm very excited about it. Uh, we had to develop the whole pro- systems, you know, IT solutions around it, and and then figure out the process because uh, it, it's a very difficult thing to master. The complexity is pretty high. And and then get, having to convince customers to use it is also going to be a challenge. So um, if you can pull it off, I'll be very proud of it. Great. All right. So is there like a beta version available that people can access or are you not fully launched yet that your consumers can access it? No, we uh, they can actually check out the website prontohomedelivery.com. Okay, that's P-R-O-N-T-O. And- Home Delivery, H-O-M-E-D-E-L-I-V-E-R-Y.com. Okay, great. So we'll also have that in the show notes. So anyone who is listening to the episode interested in checking that out can definitely head on over. Now, Suman, could you tell us, let's say our listeners listen to this episode and they're pumped up by your book. They're interested in knowing some more about you and even about this new startup that you're a part of. How can they find you online? Well, um, the best place to find me is, of course, LinkedIn. My profile is on LinkedIn, and I I write quite a bit on LinkedIn. Okay. Uh, uh, Suman Sarkar, and I think that's, if you search for it, it will open up my profile. They can all, of course, check my two companies. I have uh, Mm 13-s-consulting.com and then Pronto Home Delivery, where I've been spending a whole lot of time. Right. Um, They can find a lot of information. My books actually share a lot of information and they are available on Amazon in different formats, uh, hardcover, audible, and also ebooks. So it, it's very easy to find me on you know internet. It's, I've good. made it quite easy. <laughs> Excellent. All right, Suman, before we wrap our interview up, we always like to ask our guests, is there one quote or saying that you have that during times of adversity, you will draw on this particular quote or saying, and it helps you to refocus and just remind yourself of, you know, why you're doing what you're doing and where you're going. Well, there is one thing I believe in, and that says this too shall pass. (laughs) (laughs) 
It's funny. So whether it's whether it's a good time or bad time, right? Yeah, I look at it and say, okay, this too shall pass. Right. It's gonna you're gonna get through it. Yes, one way or another. So never, I never presume or take for granted that the good times will last or the bad times will last. You know, it Very just true. it's a we just live through it. Yeah, that's true. Very good. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much, Suman, for taking time out of your very busy schedule to sit with us today and basically share all of these great nuggets and um, sources of inspiration and um, knowledge filled content that we can utilize to navigate our customers experience better. Um, We will definitely have the link to your book, Customer Driven Disruption, Five Strategies to Stay Ahead of the Curve. As Suman indicated, the book is available on all platforms. If you're a reader, you can buy the physical book. If you are an auditory learner, you can purchase the book through Amazon's Audible and listen to it, you know, when you're exercising or watching or um, cooking or driving. And of course, you know, he's available on LinkedIn and we're going to have all of these links available so you can reach out to him. Thank you again, Saman, for sharing with us. Well, thank you, Yannick, for having me. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure. Thank you. So to those of our listeners that are here with us on the episode today, please be reminded if you'd like to join our private Facebook group, you can head on over to Facebook. It's called Navigating the Customer Experience Community. And of course, feel free to follow us on Twitter at Navigating CX. So until next time, I'm your host, Yannick Grant. Thanks for listening. For more awesome resources to take your customer service game to another level, head over to navigatingthecustomerexperience.com. See you next time.